Hey, it's me, your Uncle Cooper. Sorry to interrupt your music. I do love music, especially when it's set at a reasonable volume. You know, music is really only as good as your speakers. The same is true for minivans. A minivan is only as good as the tires it sits on. And the button on the screen there, it agrees with me. If you click on it, it'll bring you to all the Cooper minivan tires that'll make your minivan a really good minivan. Go with the Coopers! Cooper! Think you know Amazon? Think again. Did you know you can get a seasonal warehouse job offer today? You don't even need to interview. That means you can make extra cash before the holidays. You can even pick your own payday. And seasonal jobs can lead to full-time, regular employment. You'll be amazed by what you can get as an Amazon Warehouse Associate. To learn more about all the benefits of working a seasonal job at Amazon, go to amazon.com slash hourly. Amazon is proud to be an equal opportunity employer. The following is brought to you by the Social Suplex Podcast Network. This is John Silver, lead recruiter of The Dark Order, and you are listening to All Things Elite. And 68th episode of Social Suplexes podcast about AEW with a proclivity for positivity. Welcome to All Things Elite. My name is Austin Somewhat and I am the host of this lovely show. I am back after having to take a small little break from last week because of changing schedules and stuff like that and a lot of busyness happening with work. But I am back for this episode to talk about the third anniversary of All Elite Wrestling Dynamite. But I'm joined, of course, by my good friend and my partner and my co-host, Floyd Johnson Jr., my man, how are you doing? I am doing well, just counting down the days to November 1st when the Christmas season starts. And and we are exactly nine days away from my happiest time of the year, The Rock's Black Adam uh, <laughs> releases. I have tickets to the 4 o'clock Thursday show with the wife. Then the next day, I'm going with my friend Jason. Then the next day, I'm going with my uncle. And yeah, that I am. I, I'm already going to see the movie three times. The Rock deserves my money. He deserves your money. DC will begin anew, and a, there's going to be a surprise, surprise appearance in the in the uh, post credit scene. I'm not going to ruin it for you. Don't Google it. Just wait. Go see the movie. But yeah, I'm in a really good mood. And my Chiefs, my Kansas City Chiefs, with the real Superman in this world, Patrick Mahomes down 17 nothing to the Las Vegas Raiders, win the game 30 to 29. Even after the referees tried to give the Raiders the game uh, by calling the worst uh, roughing the passer I've ever seen in my life uh uh the falcons would like to have a word with you because apparently you touch tom brady you're getting penalized well how are you roughing the passer when the quarterback doesn't even have the ball right yes he doesn't even have the ball so you can't rough what he's not a passer anymore he's a defender he technically tackled chris no <laughs> So there you go. You know, but uh, we're I could go off on that all day. I don't believe refs. I I I have always been. I never blame the refs for a game. And like last night proved that's why I don't blame refs for a game. He screwed us. They screwed us on one call. But I feel like the Raiders. I feel like it evened out in the second half. The Raiders had eleven penalties. Chiefs had five. Whatever. 
I don't know. Bunch of makeup calls. I don't know how it works, but uh, I'm very happy where where my Chiefs are right now. Uh, I'm sorry about your lines this week. I know we're not. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. We're not talking about it. No, I'm a, we're on the buy. We're on the buy. We're not talking until Dallas. I still want it to be known. I'm sorry, and to anyone that is into gambling, whether it's through my bookie or whatever, hopefully it's legal in your state. I would bet on the Raiders quite a bit for the rest of the season. Their schedule gets way easier, and I think they're a really good team, honestly. I, I mean, after watching the game, yeah, they were better than us for a large part of that game. I'm not talking about football right now, but <laughs> regardless, regardless, yes, uh, it's good to be uh, it's good to be here talking about AEW. Of course, we have reached the three year anniversary of AEW Dynamite, uh, so we got a lot to talk about with Dynamite Rampage and Battle of the Belts as well that took place after Rampage. But before we get to everything. Uh, I would like to make sure you guys are downloading this fine show on Google or Apple Podcasts. And if you listen to us on Spotify or wherever you listen to us, uh, please give us a share with your friends, family, coworkers, whoever you wish. It means the world to us. And you can also leave a rating and a review. Let us know how we are doing. But the easiest way for you guys to support us does not take much time at all is if you follow us on social media. We are at AT Elite Pod on Twitter. At Social Suplex are the guys that make this show possible. Be sure to check out all the other shows they have on their network. I am at Austin Sumowitz, S-Z-U-M-O-W-I-C-Z. And Floyd is at Floyd Johnson Jr. on Twitter. And of course, the big news of the week is the wonderful anniversary of AEW. It's been just a crazy few years uh, being a fan of this company, being a fan of the wrestlers that have been... uh, uh, came into the company from the beginning, became stars over time, um, seeing all the guys that joined the company as time moved on, the champions that were crowned, the moments that happened, the returns, the debuts, the amazing things that the company has done. Uh, yeah, there was a lot of uh, great Dude, things that like I, to I, just reminisce over. From the time of my first trip to Chicago, which was uh, for a pro wrestling tee signing for the Elite to now uh i had never weird thing i had never been to chicago before 2016 ever wow zero times never flew through there never been to chicago funny enough actually i didn't want to cut you off but actually my first trip to chicago i think i was i think i was still in middle school i think this was like in 2010 i think was when i went to chicago and I believe we went to second uh, the Second City uh, uh, Improv Comedy Club, uh, and uh, they were doing like you know like one of those improv things that you would see from Whose Line, where like fans would uh, I mean uh, audience members would write down a little like thing that people could say during their scene. And me being a fan of John Cena, when I first got into wrestling, uh, I wrote "You can't see me," and uh, the person said it and pulled it out, and uh, the guy who was the MC of the event looks directly at me because of course once they said our line we were all like yeah they said our thing the guy looks directly at me and just goes with the you can't see me motion i was like oh my god he gets it and then afterwards i had a conversation with some of them about pro wrestling and just really found out like because like i said i was new to wrestling i did not realize how much of a mecca pro wrestling was for uh in chicago uh, and it grew to become one of my favorite cities. Uh, I hate your sports teams, but I love uh, the pro wrestling vibe that Chicago uh, has. Doesn't also it does also help that one of my favorite wrestlers of all time came there. But uh, yeah, that, I just wanted to say that real quick. But I'll give it back to Floyd though. No, uh, it's funny because all ten times I've been to Chicago now has been for AEW. You know, or, you know, some AEW wrestlers. Even when I went on my birthday weekend and got stuck in Chicago for a day. Well, not stuck, but chose to stay in Chicago for a day and watch movies. It was because I was on the way to CFTR, who, of course, works for AEW. So it's crazy. Like, they, the, the AEW has changed my life, has changed my priorities. This show has happened. <laughs> this show exists because of AEW. Uh, you know, Cody uh, was my uh, Cody definitely was my guy at AEW until he departed. And but it's given me Darby, who I just thought was nothing when I first saw him. And you know, so many different things that changed my mind as far as how I watch wrestling. People that are like a part of my life, 
my like circle of people I talk to mostly are people I've either met from AEW or you know through that company. I'm talking JR, who I met at uh I believe we met at Double or Nothing, the first Double or Nothing. Uh Tiffany, of course. I met her at uh I met her in line at NWA seventy. But we honestly our first show together, the first all out was our first show together. Where we sat in the front rows together. It's just you and Sydney, of course. Yep. That goes without saying. It was like literally if the elite's not a thing, if AEW's not a thing, most of the people that I spend a majority of my life communicating with, talking to, friends with, I they don't have it. I met the social suplex guys at all in, you know, which is indirectly AEW. You know what I mean? Uh, it's just so crazy how much just a company being born is, has changed, you know, in in my particular, my life, it's like, like, I was like, oh, I might not go to full gear. I don't feel right not going to full gear. So I'm like, talk to my wife. She's like, yeah, we'll make, we'll make it happen. Even if you just got to fly in, fly out, we got to make it happen because it's just like, I've been to every pay-per-view and this stuff. And I'm not saying that to brag in any way. It's just, I've been fortunate enough to make it to all the events. Uh, I've been unfortunate enough to make it all the events, and it's just like without Tony Khan, Chris Jericho, uh, to a lesser extent, CM Punk, all the members of the elite, uh, Brandon Cutler, I'm like, all the people in Nakazawa, I want to throw everybody, I'm like, all the name Chrissy that works for the AEW merchants, uh, merchandise, Sam and security, I could throw all the names out of the there that it's just like, without all of them, like, my life's completely different. So I definitely think AEW and all the members of the, all the members of the roster, the staff, everybody, because like I said, life's completely different without AEW. Absolutely. Same, same thing goes here as well. Like I said, shout out Sam, shout out all the cool people that we've met and everything like that. It's been awesome. Um, but we'll move off of that and actually get into AEW Dynamite uh, for their third year anniversary. Um, now, do you want to mention this first, um, or do you want to mention, uh, this when we get to the actual, when we get to the actual match, uh, because there was once again, oh, so great drama happening backstage during this show. Dude, yeah, let's talk about the drama. Let's talk about it. Okay. I love the drama, you know. Oh, I know you do. And, uh, thankfully it doesn't involve my boy, so I got nothing, I got nothing that I can't, like, I don't have to defend myself all of a sudden. I can just talk about it. Okay. So, there was some subtweeting happening, uh, over the weekend, and it then grew to be direct tweeting between, uh, Sammy Guevara and Andrade. And, uh, basically... I've actually, I'm going to try and see if the tweets are still there. They might be covered up by this point because Sammy is constantly, you know, promoting the vlog because he, he he's, he's looking to get the views uh, now that uh, he's getting the, the, the looks because of all the shit that's been going on and whatnot. But uh, let's see if the tweets are still, oh yeah, they are still here. Okay, so Sammy Guevara tweeted on October 3rd, uh, you are a jobber, a favor hire, be grateful, be- bitch. And uh, Andrade said, uh, tweeted uh, the next day, I said it to your face if you had a problem with me and you said nothing. I won't beat your ass because I'm a professional. D- professional. Don't be scared. When I say something, I name names and I'm not scared to get fired. Hashtag Sammy. And then uh, un- Sammy Guevara responds saying, you didn't say shit to me, you liar, but here's some truth, you ungrateful prick. You will, you would be jobless if it wasn't for your dad-in-law. Are you really mad at me or mad at yourself for failing to get over for a second time? Just go back to WWE like we all know you want to and fuck off. And pff, it's just, you know, bunch of shit there. It was just lots, lots and lots of drama regarding that whole thing and uh yeah so basically moving off of that we got reports back uh from backstage uh saying that a fight had broke out between andrade and sammy guevara and andrade got sent home 
and Sammy did not get sent home. And we know this because he was still in the main event tag team match uh, that took place on Dynamite. Um, I think that's pretty much everything covered. Uh, I don't know necessarily uh, if there were any suspensions issued out or whatnot, but regardless of the fact, we know that happened. Uh, People were swinging. And I'll go to Floyd on this first because I know he he lives for this. Dude, I was like cheesing and everybody's like, oh, my God, the drama. We just want to go one week without any drama backstage at AEW. Screw that. I want more drama. Let's (laughs) go. Let's go. First of all, I want to say this very controversial thought. Sammy Guevara needs a heater. I don't care. (laughs) I don't care who it is. He needs to find him. Maybe Parker Boudreaux. He just needs to find some huge dude that won't let anybody mess with him. Because I'm starting to believe his mouth might be might be more, bigger than his physical capabilities of defending himself. Yes. And so, um, yeah. So he needs a heater. He needs protection. Sean Sean went and got Big Kev. You know, he went and Sean Michaels went and got Nash. So Tammy Guevara needs to get a heater. Become friends with Morrissey. Nobody's messing with that seven foot dude. Become become friends with Satnam Singh. Well, yeah, Satnam Singh, just hang around him. Get him on the vlog and make everybody like him, dude. Whatever you do, you need a heater. You need someone to protect you. And I mean, I know you're a grown man, but come on, look at Andrade. I'm just saying. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not saying. That I don't think that fight one on one goes the way you want it to. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just just saying. I mean, Sammy might got hands. Maybe Sammy might got hands. He might be like Floyd Mayweather and just knocking people out. Whatever. I don't know. But I'm just saying his mouth seems to write checks. So he needs somebody to just be like, okay, you know, someone to calm down the situation. Shit in the back. Second of all, this is everybody wants to blame Sammy for this situation. Andrade doesn't want to be in AEW anymore. Andrade has asked for his release. Andrade was not granted his release. Andrade saw a way to get tried to get fired. He saw a person that he could use to get himself fired. Andrade tried to use that person to get him fired. That's it. It's that simple. This is not on Sammy. Andrade, they have a backstage thing that was reported, it, speculation or whatever, where they tell people, hey, if you have a problem, keep it indoors. Keep it in house. Talk to you know. Talk to the people there. Right. All right. That's what Sammy did. He didn't like you know. Again, he didn't like a long time ago that Andrade was hitting. He went to management. Right. That's what you're supposed to do. You know. You don't want a physical flight. You go to management. Management talks to the people. You get it taken care of. I literally saw this play out on TV with Jade and Red. Uh, Jade and Red Velvet. I don't know yep. how much of that was real, but I saw it play out. You you go to management. They bring you together, you talk, you don't do shit, right? Andrade, first chance he gets, goes on the interview and basically throws Sammy Guevara under the bus. Who he's he's not in a feud with, he's not in a rivalry with. Dude, he literally just picked this man to try to get to his goal, which is to get fired. He picked Sammy because he knows you can get at Sammy, right? He picked Sammy. Sammy has him in at him. They talked to them the day before the show. No physical violence. Don't fight each other. Blah, blah, blah. Apparently, by the story that's out, I don't know if it's true, but by the story that's out, I'm drawing they su- uh, he suck out Stan- at Sammy, and he went looking for Sammy and started trying to fight him. All that says is this man is trying to get fired. <laughs> it's that simple. This is not Sammy has a problem with everybody. No, this man chose Sammy and was trying to get fired. That's all. Sammy didn't do, I'm like, if you look at the situation, Sammy didn't do anything. Did he get a little hot on Twitter? Yes, but apparently they talked that out before the show day. And then Andrade went after him, and apparently Sammy did everything not to fight Andrade, which is pretty freaking smart. Um... You know, he went out his way not to fight Andrade. That's why Andrade got sent home and Sammy got to stay. It, it, it's, it's, it's like people want to make things way more complicated than it has to be. Well, Sammy keeps getting in stuff, so it must be Sammy. It must be maturity. I'm like, no, 
this man doesn't want to work at AEW anymore. He doesn't. He's very open with it on Twitter. This is not speculation. He even put that he hoped he lost a loser Lee's AEW match. He hoped that he lost this match. Then he started a fight so he could get fired. Am I making sense to you, Austin? I I, yeah. I think I'm say, I'm just going to be repeating myself over and over again. So I'm gonna yeah, quit talking. I, listen, yes. yeah. <laughs> no, again, like I said, I I I, I understand why people hate Sammy Guevara. I understand completely. He's very hateable. He's very very hateable. Punchable face. Punchable face. Arrogant loud with his girlfriend and his uh, fiance actually at this point and they got married so wife so they're very loud in that regard i understand but like like floyd said again i i and i understand why andrade wants to leave and him not being granted his release because he signed a contract that's a lot more of like you know you signed for this amount of time you, you won't let you're not gonna buy out your contract like that you're gonna just play it out Look, man, it's just like he he's looking for an out. And his out was, you know what? I just saw the Elite and CM Punk get sent home. Send me home, motherfuckers, is exactly what this man's trying to get to happen. And that's what happened. So is it professional? No, absolutely not. Uh, is it more unneeded controversy for the backstage area for AEW? In my opinion, yes. I think this is, like, too much. Floyd says it's not enough. But I would say, you know, this would be better in an instance where, like, you know, if we're looking at it as competition, which I'm not always. Because, again, AEW is doing great things. WWE is doing great things. Fucking Bray Wyatt's back. It's amazing. It's wonderful. The return was great. It's awesome. And even the Good Brothers are back, which I'm sure two people are happy about. But regardless, uh... <laughs> This and not looking at it this as competition, but if you go into the idea of like Tony Khan, who absolutely views this as co competition, you do not want this when you the other company is doing amazing things and causing all this great buzz, and you do not want backstage shit happening at the same time that 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 good things are happening at the other company. So, you know, there's that. So I mean, and you know what? What you're saying is fair. Don't get me wrong. What you're saying is fair, but. In my in my my life is, I always say this. My life's rather boring, <laughs> so I love me some little wrestling drama, and it's fun for me. I, I don't know. know why people get caught up in it, because for the most part, for the most part, I mean, it really doesn't affect the show on Wednesday. AEW no. goes yeah. out there on Wednesdays and they deliver great shows. I'm not saying matches don't get canceled or anything like that. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying the quality of the show has not went down. If you're being honest with yourself, the quality of the show is still the best weekly wrestling show on TV. And it's not close. I enjoy SmackDown. I think SmackDown is good. And I think it has gotten to the level where it's consistently okay to good. I think Raw has good show, really good shows like this week was probably the best Raw of the year. or And I think they have shows where it's like, can I have that three hours of my life back? I think they exist. I never have that with AEW. It is good to great. Even when I'm like, oh, that wasn't the episode I want. When you think about it as a wrestling show episode, it, it was probably good. It's just they've hit home run so many times. You're like, when they hit a double, you're like, eh. And then they hit a single, you're like, well, mate, it's not a home run, but but no, it's still a hit. And that's when I, I you know, I say that about the show, and it's just not because I'm on a AEW, because literally, I, well, I can't say that anymore. I used to watch everything. I, I have uh, shrunk down my wrestling viewing so as to avoid burnout. Uh, but it's just, you know, when you get to a point in time, most people objectively will say Dynamite is the best show of the week. Yeah, I would say that is absolutely the case still. Um, but yes, no, there was a lot of whole shit surrounding that. And, you know, just felt the need that we had to bring it up still. Oh, but yeah, yeah, we had to bring it up. It would be uh, it would be almost irresponsible for us not to bring it up. But, mm -mm. Yeah, I'm telling you, pig and slop. That's me. I am happy 
It's like this is a warm and bell, a warm bath of filth. This is terrible. <laughs> Could we go without it? Absolutely. Wrestling can be fine without all this. I just think it's so much better when it's there. You know, it's like, oh my god. And like, we, yes. And I'm hope for my friends that don't like this. I'm hoping for a good. We could make it all the way to full gear without any controversy. This is for I'm you. Just, I'm, I'm hoping I, that for you, not me. I'm, look, man, I'm just sitting here. I'm just sitting here with my first dance figure that just came in the mail. That's in literal ice cream bar packaging. I'm just sitting here, and I'm just like, you know what? I'm good. I'm just. I, I'm. I'm good. Yeah, I'm just sitting here waiting on me, Jackie and Jr. The the FTR group to all get our FTR jackets so we can put up our three pictures up there. I got yeah. figure protectors coming. I mean, dude, this is, no, no, no. Oh, yes, and Friday, I am buying my TNT red belt. I am oh. so excited. I know I don't get it till March, but, uh, yeah. So I was going to say if you were going to, if you were going to get that, yeah. Yeah, no, uh, no, uh, I forgot what, uh, Cody called her. But uh, lady in, the lady in red has to, has to. And it's, it, it was like, I told my wife, uh, I know none of y'all care about this, but I'm going to say it. I told my wife, and she said, and, and my wife doesn't cuss a lot. She really doesn't. <laughs> she said, fuck no, you don't need this. <laughs> and I say, I was like, huh? Go, you because know, my wife doesn't say no to me much. I mean, honestly, look at my life. She doesn't say no to me. I don't know how to react to this. I'm like, I don't know what's going on. But she's like, no, you don't fucking need that belt. And like, and she reiterated. And I was like, and then I came into the room. I was like, but, but, I was like, but it's Cody's belt. And she's like, what do you mean it's Cody's belt? And I sent her the picture of Cody wearing the belt before he got the shit beat out of him by Brody Lee. And she was like, Oh, so it's Cody's belt. And I was like, yeah, it's Cody's belt. She's like, okay, you got to buy it. And that, that is. See, 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 you can say, see, you can say that. But then when I go to my folks and be like, (laughs) but no, the spinner belt is CM Punk's belt. And they don't care. They're like, you're not buying a replica title. And I'm just like, God damn it. Yeah, no, no. She was like, uh, you know, I said it's Cody's belt. And she immediately got it, and she was like, "Yeah, you gotta get it." And I worked extra. Don't get me wrong; I, it just did not come out of the budget. I put in the extra time. I worked two extra days that I did not want to work, so I could buy the belt straight up, no credit. It's coming home. I'm glad to hear. That sounds like it's gonna be a great addition to the collection. Now I'm ready for the tag belts. I know if honestly, if you're, you're if you're smart, they think you think they gotta do the women's belt first fair yes it has to be the next one but dude when the tag belt's coming out me jr definitely gonna have one i've already told him it's going down what the fuck bro it's going down are you telling me are you telling me i wouldn't be your cash to your decks you know what you do have more hair than jr i mean that's what i'm saying dude I, i'm just saying you made a jr doesn't listen to the show so, but you made an interesting argument, you know. Cause, I am, I'm just putting it out there, brother man. I'm just saying. <laughs> you you have more. Think it. There, think it over. Yeah. Think it over. Yes, I'm. I'm looking forward to that. But uh, <laughs> yes, y'all have heard enough about me and my drama to get uh, a, a toy belt. <laughs> a toy belt that's over five hundred dollars. Yeah, forty one year old man trying to get a uh, begging his wife to get a toy belt. Yeah, that happened. This week in the Johnson household. Yes, ladies, I am taken. I am taken. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Well, we'll get to the show now. We'll go ahead and we'll open things up with Maxwell Jacob Freeman, MJF, facing off against Wheeler Yuta. These two guys have been going at it for the past few weeks. Yuta probably cut his best promo. I've seen him cut last week on Dynamite. I was a, I was bummed that I couldn't talk about it because I loved his promo and how he was talking about how he wanted to beat him up in Philly. I thought that was great. Uh, but uh, regardless, uh, you know what? And we, we we did talk about you know like I have heard people like oh man he's I've seen serious growth from Yuta on the mic yeah including that promo and that's. 
if you look at him and how they're building, that's going to be his character. He is going to be no nonsense. I want to fight guy. He is young John Moxley right now. That's mm-hmm. that's it. It's just like he's like I'm, I'm not going to out talk you. I'm not going to cut a soliloquy about you know and say all the things. I'm going to punch you in the face. Yeah. No, I think I think he's going to keep getting better and better on the mic. And like I said last week, I thought was one of his best promos. But this was the first match that we've seen MJF in in 129 days. Uh, Excalibur brought up. Um, and these guys did a lot of really good work. Yuta continues to showcase why he's so good and why people were going nuts about him joining the Blackpool Combat Club in the first place. Because I know there were some people like, you know, it's like, oh, man, Yuta's going to get killed because he's going up against the hottest thing in AEW and MJF. And I'm like, nope, MJ, Yuta's going to be fine. He's going to be, he knows exactly how to take a situation like this and run with it. And he did. He did great, great work as uh, when MJF, there was a great moment where MJF uh, rolled all the way to the one end of the ring and Yuta still landed a splash off the top rope. These guys were like trading like one, two, one, two, one, two pins over and over and then trading off a uh, possible tombstone turned into a different tombstone. But then regardless, I uh, still got out of it. I will say, one of the things that I saw that I've never seen before, honestly, the power bomb that MJ threw, uh, MJF threw on Yuta when he power bombed him onto his knee, like, that was fucking, cr- like, I couldn't believe that. I was like, Jesus. Um, but besides that, you know, Yuta got the hammer and amb- anvil elbows, tried to get his seatbelt uh, submission, but then got turned into the salt of the earth. Yuta was able to try to get towards the ropes, but then he flipped it over and then was able to kind of, like, roll over top of him to make it even harder. Basically, his version of, like, a figure eight version of a heart of a, of a uh, arm bar, you know, once he has you in the first one, yeah, you could get out of it, but once he flips over, you're screwed. Uh, MJF wins. Yuta is forced to tap. However, after the match, though, Yuta gets up and sticks out his hand asking for him to shake his hand and said, like, listen to the people listen to them like shake my hand just sh- like show me this much respect you saw a possible thought about it from mjf and as they got close lee mortiarty from the firm comes in and blindsides you to mjf yells i didn't tell you to do that stokely hathaway is there and he is like hands him the ring and says do it mjf is appar- prepared to do it but then william regal who is on commentary throws on some brass knuckles gets in the ring they retreat and Regal and MJF are just standing in the ring. MJF walks away and Dude. very visibly frustrated. Dude, the coolest moment. The coolest moment. William Regal just in his elegant, you know, Regal way. No lack of a better word, Regal way. Gets up and the most violent gentleman shit ever gets up. And what does he have in his pocket? Brass knucks. Because you know what? You don't have to get ready if you stay ready. And William Regal's always ready to throw. He's like, I'm I'm not coming down there. I'm not coming down there to fight somebody. I'm not going to risk I'm too old for you. Too old for that shit. I'm going to put on the brass knucks and knock your ass out. And it's just going to be quick and over with. Hey, MJF, as smart as he is, as tough as he is, as much as he talk, he know not to mess with William Regal. No, yeah, absolutely, and I've loved what Regal's been doing. His his fucking moments of just like his love fest with Excalibur is the funniest thing ever. It's amazing. I love it so. I love it, love it so. But yeah, this little interaction with him and MJF was great. Um, the tease. Um, I don't know why anybody's buying into this. I have no idea why people are looking into this and being like, is MJF going to turn babyface? No. 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 We've seen... There is no way that this man, who is so committed to being the biggest piece of shit, is going to turn heel. I mean, turn babyface. There's no way. The tease, I think, is really cool. And I think the... I didn't tell you to do that shows how, you know... Oh well, you know how how not in control of the firm, of the firm yeah, exactly. He might not be, you know, 
And that and that adds to the element of like you know like how they're not really his group; they're just on call, and they. But it's still Stokely's group. Yes. So. Yes, it, and it's like you know Lee Moriarty made it clear he wants the pure title. And you know what? He might see Yuta <laughs> as a you know someone in the way of him going for Garcia in the pure title. So mm-hmm. we just you know there's so many layers to it, and you know and that's what I look for in wrestling. Every segment, every show, everything has, you know, can lead to something else. Yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm really excited to see the continuation of, like, what this firm group becomes. Because I still want to see, like, what they can do. I still think that, wow, you know, there's a little bit of concern with the firm. I think that they can still do good things. I love Stokely. I think he's really good. And I just want to see what comes of it. And it's the interaction between them and MJF is interesting, and I'm willing to see it out. But uh, we then moved off to Darby Allen and Jay Lethal. Uh, and this was a solid match, you know. Jay got working on Darby's knee, which was the story of the match. Uh, regardless, though, Darby was able to uh, really keep fighting and fighting. Sanjay Dutt and Satnam Singh walked out into the ring. Lethal told them beforehand uh, he didn't need him for this match and told them to get back. Darby was able to reverse uh, uh, a, a pinfall attempt from Lethal, get the Last Supper, pin him, and it shows how Jay Lethal might be moving away from Satnam Singh and Sanjay Dutt as Darby forced pretty much Lethal at, to shake his hand, and that one ended up happening as after Darby shoved him, eventually he just forcefully got in for the handshake and then ran and then walked off. Um so it looks like we might be seeing the separation of Satnam and uh, Sanjay. Yeah, but which, if you think about it, they've kind of it's run its course. It has. That's the thing, though. It's like he's he's won, he's went up and lost against everybody, and it's just like at some point you have to look at you know a group and be like, dude, all I do is lose. I mean, what is sure? This and doing? then also too, it's like you know, like you you gotta see that see it as what it is you know if if sanjay is trying to be like the the muscle for the most part like we don't see him used a lot like he just shows up he's just there for the look for the most part um not counting rampage or dark or dark elevation or anything like that but on dynamite he just kind of shows up so it makes sense why this is kind of like you know what we've done what we've done with this we 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 might be moving off of this i think which i think is fair enough because you know, I just don't think there's much else we can do. Correct. Yeah, I agree with that. We then had TNT Championship match between Mr. Mayhem Wardlow and the Machine Brian Cage, a.k.a. Floyd's favorite thing, big meaty men slapping meat. Oh, my God, this match. Bro, the moment where, like, uh, both of these guys did amazing moments where they were just beating the shit out of each other, but then eventually uh, Wardlow hits a hurricanrana, and then we have freaking... Uh, Brian Cage proceeding to try and do a freaking uh, 619. Uh, the big meaty men slapping meat showing that they can also do other things that big men shouldn't be able to do. All right, let me tell you about Brian Cage. I, I, I've said this on the show. I think he's incapable of having a bad match. I think the fact that he hasn't been used more in AEW is almost criminal at this point. I'm not even saying he has to win. I, I'm really not. He's just a guy that his style in wrestling is very entertaining. He, I'm like, like literally his times in the match, I wanted to cheer for him. And it's just like, he's going up against, uh, he's going up against the war dog Wardlow. It, they have a great match. I honestly, you know, me personally, a small critique. I would have liked Wardlow not to just dominate and win this match. Yeah, but again, like I said, it just seems like an instance where it's like Wardlow, you know, he's he's tied in with uh, N- Prince Nana and that whole faction, and that's a pure Ring of Honor thing, and like, it just seems like they're keeping them mostly separated <laughs> off to like being Ring of Honor things. Yeah, it's just that he did the Powerbomb Symphony, and it's just like, the Powerbomb Symphony is such a dominant way to win, and it's great, and it's great for certain people, but when you have somebody that, you know can be used to still put people over in the future. I don't think the Powerbomb Symphony is the way to go. I think one Maybe power just, bomb, yeah. get the pin, then he get attacked. It's just, there is a certain person that the Powerbomb Symphony is for, and it's obvious, but it's just like, I don't know. It just seemed, came off as so dominant. 
that I, I, I did not want that to happen for uh, Brian Cage. Again, that's it's kind of like a, a Floyd preference thing more than anything. But I like I said, I probably see more in Brian Cage than, you know, maybe TK sees in him. But yeah, uh, the end of the match. Yes. Yes. It was we kind of- then had Gates of Agony and uh, them come out to beat up Wardlow. But Samoa Joe then sprints out and comes out to uh, save him. And then after Samoa Joe, though, the embassy has the numbers advantage and they still swarm Joe. The music of FTR hits and the crowd explodes. Which also, can I say, the footage of fans singing their theme at New Japan. Oh my god. It's the best. The fucking best. Uh, actually, was it New Japan? No, it was, it was the UK, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was a New Japan show in the UK. That's right, yeah. Called, it's, it, it that's why it threw Quest. me off. That's yes. why it threw me off. No, But regardless, yeah, but um, the Ring of Honor World Tag Team Champions come out, and they join in and believe they're still the AAA Tag Team Champions, if I'm not mistaken, as well. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, they, they even the odds, and dude. they don't want to fuck with the FTR. No, dude. That was, it was such a moment, because I wasn't expecting it to happen, and it was such a cool moment, and it's it's the world is seeing FTR, you know, like the world, you know what I mean? Like in the UK and it just seems like everybody's behind FTR. And I'm just at this point where I'm just like, it's a really good feeling for them. You know what I mean? It had nothing to do with me for them. It's just like, I've known these dudes were dope forever. And I'm not saying no one else did. Cause they're, they've had a lot of fans forever. I'm, it's just, I've known that they were dope forever. And now to see everybody else, Seeing how dope they are, it's great. I can't wait for the match with them and uh, United Empire. What I, I forgot what that uh, specific tag team goes by, but uh, when that match gets on New Japan, it's gonna be a banger. But them coming out and then the fans going crazy, it's just like put these guys on TV more, you know? <laughs> I'm just like, why not? Seriously, I'm like, I mean, your fans love them, and you say you listen to the fans, but they get monster pops. Every con to come out to wrestle. Yeah, no, they do. It's yeah. like I just I, I want these guys so badly. I know it's gonna be difficult with like you know the claimed holding the tag team titles, which we're about to get to um, pretty soon. But man, these guys—they're just the biggest thing, and so, it's so clear to see, dude. Dude, and it was cool. I liked how the uh, Gates of Agony played it. That like they didn't want to scare it and they wanted to fight and they were like oh, standing yeah. there staring to my eye and it built a little tension for uh a uh, little built a little tension for Friday so yeah yeah well we then had um excuse me we then had the trios match between AEW interim women's champion Tony Storm Athena and Willow Nightingale facing off against Jamie Hayter, Penelope Ford, and Serena Deeb. And uh, Britt Baker had said earlier that uh, Soraya was not competing because she was not cleared to compete. Um, and he, she's like, so I guess it makes it my house now. Um, and I the tri- immediately knew that Soraya was going to get <laughs> in the physical at that And play. that was the big thing there. It's like, you know, this match I thought was solid. I love the fact that Willow Nightingale has been used a lot in AEW. I think she's good. Um, and we got a little bit more information about her as well uh, in this show. Um, but, I mean, the, the Willow Nightingale was the one who got the pinfall victory on Penelope Ford, who I will say continues to get better since she's gotten back. Um, but Britt Baker then gets in the ring and gets in the face of, uh, Soraya, who was there, uh, ringside for this match, and immediately they start beating the shit out of each other, and there's your sign, she's good to go, and pretty good ring shape is what Tony Schiavone said, uh, for Soraya, for Soraya, and yeah, man, it's looking, it's looking like it's gonna be amazing to be able to see her wrestle again, it's gonna be such a good sign. Yes, it, yes, I'm excited to see what she can do. Um, you know, when she wrestled, when she was wrestling, I loved her and AJ Lee. I thought they were great. Uh, I loved her matches with uh I, I loved her matches with Emma at the time. I so I'm really looking to see what her and Britt can do. 
dream match shit. I do think she can raise the AEW's women's vision, division to another level. But it's just, you know, it's not just going to be her being there to another level. You're going to have to put them in spots to succeed and fail. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, and you're going to have to let them fail a couple times. It can't be like, oh, this segment wasn't good. I'm never putting women on my TV again. You're going to have to let them fail and get better. Yeah. I mean, that's just, that's how it works. You, you know, no one's going to be perfect at the first time. Yeah, no question. But uh, we move on, though, to the the best thing in the entire show. The best thing in the entire show. The celebration of National Scissors Scissoring Day with your new AEW World Tag Team Champions, The Acclaimed, featuring Max Caster, Anthony Bowens, and badass Billy Gunn. First off, I must say, because on Raw this past week, DX celebrated their anniversary, uh, and Billy was not there. And Road Dog, of course, said his famous uh, New Age Outlaws long catchphrase that everyone knows and loves. He let the fans say the badass Billy Gunn. He didn't say it, but the fans did. And then Corey Graves on commentary said, last we've heard of a... Hey, it's me, your Uncle Cooper. Sorry to interrupt your music. I do love music, especially when it's set at a reasonable volume. You know, music is really only as good as your speakers. The same is true for minivans. A minivan is only as good as the tires it sits on. And the button on the screen there, it agrees with me. If you click on it, it'll bring you to all the Cooper minivan tires that'll make your minivan a really good minivan. Go with the Coopers! Cooper! Tired of long waits and rushed care at the ER and urgent care clinic? Next time, stay home and let Dispatch Health bring the power of the hospital to you. I call Dispatch Health. A care team of medical professionals actually come to your house. They're the same caliber of people that you would see if you were at a hospital or an urgent care. Dispatch Health can treat most non-life-threatening emergencies. They can do the x-rays. They can do stitches. Urinary tract infections, blood tests, urinalysis, ultrasound. It's almost everything that they can do at the ER. You never feel rushed. They're there for you and only you. I felt like their only patient. And it costs no more than a trip to urgent care because Dispatch Health is covered by most insurance, including Medicare. See if we serve your home at DispatchHealth.com. Dispatch Health really went above and beyond. It's wonderful to have care come to your home. House calls are back, and they're better than ever. Learn more at DispatchHealth.com. Billy Gunn, he's been working with office supplies. Yes, that, that was very, that was very Here's good. the thing. I can't stand Corey Graves for the life of me. I hate that man with everything in my body. But that was a very good job. I have to give him credit. Very good line there. Um... Now, secondly, with this segment, watch it if you haven't seen it. This was amazingly done. Uh, Anthony Bowens leads off with the very first annual National Scissoring Day at Washington, D.C. And talks about how they're the most popular team in all of professional wrestling, the winningest team in all of AEW history, the best damn homegrown team in all of AEW history, and... They have the best-selling AEW t-shirt of 2022. And now AEW stands for Acclaimed Every Wednesday. And he talks about how uh, he is the Sultan of Scissors. And he said, this is for those uninitiated and those who may be tuning in for the first time. Scissoring is a sign of friendship. It is a handshake. And... The people, and he, they gives, showcases that, basically, and then how the people want to be celebrated by a real team, not two guys thrown together, uh, like Swerve and Keith Lee, and how this is Daddy Ass's house, not Swerve's house. And he, Billy Gunn gets on mic and said, uh, I went down to City Hall today, and he's like, yeah, I'm a big deal, and said, uh, I wanted to present you guys with this. And hands them a giant pair of gold scissors. And it's amazing. And Max Caster, though, gets on mic and says uh, he wants to talk about greatness real quick. And how 40 years ago in the city of Washington, they won the Super Bowl. And his dad was on that championship team. And his Super Bowl ring was his uh, prized possession. He achieved great list- greatness just like the acclaim achieved greatness when they won the AEW World Tag Team titles. And they... 
they did then then he they again they talked up and down about how you know the acclaimed is for everybody everybody loves the acclaimed and how like it's like they like literally was like about to do the first bipartisan scissor in Washington DC which is amazing until Swerve Strickland came out and he's like this is the most idiotic thing i've ever seen and he said look congrats on the shirt selling well but these are the role models for your ch- children. Like we got Billy Gunn, he's gonna get kids suspended like he did 25 years ago. Uh, another great line. And he said, if it wasn't for Billy, we'd still be the AEW Tag Team Champions. And he challenges Billy Gunn one on one in a match next week, this week in fact, in Toronto. And he said, because Rock beats Scissors. And then Smart Mark Sterling comes out of fucking nowhere, so he basically so he can say pe- Paper beats Rock. Uh, and he said, listen, let's join together and I'll help you beat Swerve Strickland. That does not go well. And he, uh, gets rejected and gets the shit kicked out of him. Uh, and Billy Gunn accepts the challenge for Swerve and then they do the giant scissor in the middle of the ring. Don't forget the leg drop to his crotch, which he Yes, they leg dropped him in the dick. Which he basically got scissored. Yeah, that was the scissor. Yes. Um, real life story from, uh, Floyd uh, about this. My wife, who does not watch every week um, at all, like she, um, I said, "Hey, wife, scissor me," and she looks at me, and in all sincerity, not joking, stares at me. Isn't that a sex thing? <laughs> and I was like, "Well, yeah, but I'm talking about the handshake thing." And she looks at me, and she looks at me, and she's like. What 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 are you doing? And and then she's like, I was like, we're scissoring. And then she puts her hands up, and we scissor in the most awkward scissor that has ever <laughs> taken place in the history of man. Now she gets it. Now we can do it. But it was just like that very first time when you're trying to get someone to do it. Very awkward. It was hilarious. I wish there was. I wish there was. I honestly wish there was a cell phone of it because it was just like, it was just such an awkward moment. It was great. Uh yeah, uh this A plus segment. I if 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 we did such a thing like a segment of the year, this would be a finalist. This was great. Um this is like this was pure entertainment. This is pure sports entertainment. This is a very WWE seg- segment and it was but it was beautifully done. It was hilarious. Swerve came out to do be the killjoy that he is. Uh yeah, I enjoyed every bit of the segment. Billy Gunn has found a revival in his life being daddy ass. It's like literally he could just go by daddy yeah. ass. I mean, that's his name. You know, that was not that was I mean, I mean, you got to cut uh you got to cut Dan Housen in a little bit. But uh yeah, this is this has been great. As somebody that's always been a big Billy Gunn fan, it is just like he is uh he has found this new like spirit and you can see he's having a hell of a time. They're all having fun. It seems like most of the time in the the jokes, Matt Ca- Max Caster is sitting there trying not to laugh. Like he Seriously. they just seem like they're having the best time in the world and I couldn't be happier for those guys cuz again, started from the bottom. Now they're the champs. You can't be more proud. Swerve is perfect in his role, and I think Swerve is about to get a little more evil. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we had Madison Rain and Sky Blue backstage when they got challenged by uh, Anna Jay and Ty Conti- Ty Mello to a match on Ray- on on Friday. Uh, we then had Hang- Hangman Page versus Roosh. Um, probably, whew, I would say this would be uh, my pick for. Uh, one of, this was probably my favorite match of the show, uh, in my opinion. I thought this was really good, and because it also had a great promo between Moxley and Hangman, and how they were going to be fighting each other in Cincinnati next, not this week, but next week, uh, and it's going to be for the AEW World Championship. And he, Moxley, literally said afterwards, like, "You're a sweet kid." But you're a lot like these young kids. You get, you get, you get, you do dumb shit because your you, your mouth gets you in trouble. And I'm just like, woo, okay. So Moxley speaking a bit, uh, and he said, "Watch your damn mouth. This is your final warning." 
and yeah, I thought this was a good match. Private Party was really here for no fucking reason. Like, no reason. Like, they came down to confront Hangman afterwards, trying to protect Roosh, and then Private Party bails immediately when John Moxley... Like, they didn't even get the shit kicked out of him. They just left. Like, I don't know why they were here. There was no reason for them to be here. That was the only complaint I had about this match slash segment. Yeah, uh, the John Moxley thing felt like, to me, that they were trying to get some points across to our old friend Hangman. You know, like, and they used promo to do it. And I just loved the, you know, Mox, you know, Hangman's a badass. Mox is like, okay, you're a badass. I get it. But I'm a whole different level of monster that you've never dealt with. And it's just like that whole everything that was said. It's just like I like I am not the biggest Moxley fan in the world. But sometimes he does this these promos and there's this subtext to it and it's in his mannerisms and oh, in his tone and it's, I wonder what we're talking about yes it's the subtext and this is mannerisms and this tone to it and it just makes the moment so much more intense and it in that moment it's like these dudes are really gonna fight and it you know it gets you know it keeps me in my Realm, because I try to watch when I'm watching a show. I try to watch it like this is a shoot. Everything is real. That's the only way I can enjoy it. And it's just like, man, this drives home the fact that Moxley wants to represent the company. He wants to be the champion. He wants to fight MJF. And all that Hangman is to him is an obstacle. Yeah, makes sense there. It makes a lot of sense. But yeah, these guys did a great job in this match. We had Willow Nightingale say that she wanted to challenge Jade Cargill for the TBS Championship at Battle of the Belts. Basically, Jade was like, well, I beat you before. Like, whatever. Like, I don't care about you. But then Willow said, look, you can't win forever. I could be that same person who takes it away from you. Uh, And we then had Luchasaurus squashing Fuego del Sol until Jungle Boy comes out and nails Luchasaurus with a chair. Probably the first time that they've gotten physical at each other. Uh, and Jungle Boy said, you were my best friend in the entire world. You chose him, though, and you broke my heart. But now I'm going to break your fingers, your nose, your arm. I'm going to break you piece by piece, by miserable piece, until I break you. Pick the time and place. I'll be ready. And Christian goes, I told you not to come back, but next week on Dynamite, hometown, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you will be facing Luchasaurus. So... That is uh, that was match was announced, and I think that's cool because I think having Jungle Boy versus Luchasaurus I think will be very, very interesting just to see how that whole thing goes down. Um, and of course, Christian being backstage too. I mean, by ringside will also add to it as well. Yeah, um, I'm looking forward to what they do with Luchasaurus. They've known each other so long. I I just. I nothing in me just says they're going to have a fire match. They're going to have the most amazing. There's like, to me, there's no way in my mind that their match is not going to be awesome. Yeah. With the amount of time these guys have worked together and everything like that, I, I, I'm absolutely prepared for that match to be really freaking good. But we then move on, though, to the main event. The Ring of Honor Pure Champion Daniel Garcia teaming up with the American Dragon Brian Danielson after last week's celebration for the Ocho, who the Ring of Honor World Champion, and Chris Jericho and Sammy Guevara faced off against those two. Uh, and I thought this was a good match, honestly. I thought Jericho and Sammy uh, did good together. The Spanish, the Spanish gods, they are. Uh, and eventually, though, as things happened and. Uh, Sammy Guevara was uh, going to hit the uh, hit the GTA on Danny Garcia, uh, af- and uh, it was blocked by Garcia. Uh, well, the shooting star press was the GTA H was not, uh, but Garcia then had the Dragon Slayer put on, and then the ref was distracted. Garcia was hit with the ROH World Title. Sammy covers and pins him, gets the loudest boo of the night. I feel like, and. Uh, Jericho and Guevara win the match, and uh, I think this is the right decision for that. You know, 
Danny Garcia and Brian Danielson is a team that should win like on paper, but I think having Jericho and Sammy win helps keep this whole feud and distrust between this whole problem between Danny Garcia and Jericho continuing. And it also keeps Brian involved in the feud for a while longer. And I'm all good for this continuing onward. But again, a lot of people weren't really focused on this match for the technical aspects or anything like that, which it was a good match. It was a good main event, but they were focused on why is Sammy here? Why didn't they send him home? I hate Sammy. And I understand. I truly do. I get it. (laughs) <laughs> this match was really good. I I love Sammy. I love the I love that everyone hates him. I I've always been a fan of him. You know, everybody goes in, and I I think a lot of the hate for him is unjustified. And I really you know like I really do. I just think you know, life has happened to him a lot. It's just like when you look at like when you look at his career in AEW, and you ask yourself, what has he really done? Like the whole Sasha Banks thing happened way before he signed with AEW, like way before he signed with AEW. And and it sucked, and it shouldn't have happened. It was terrible, but, you know, it happened like years ago, but somebody, you know, tried to smear him. And then, you know, like when he got, in, you know, the whole thing with, you know, getting with Ty and all that kind of stuff, and it's just like a lot of that's just personal life and personal stuff that, Really, you shouldn't hold against them. Not saying people won't, because I am a realistic human being, and I know yep. I know people will. But I'm just like I don't I don't know what the man has done wrong, other than just being super talented, uh, amazing, and putting on great matches. You know, I know you know he's kind of rich and has a you know hot wife thing, so people hate him for that. I there understand that because I am a Cody fan, <laughs> and I, I I dealt with that already. <laughs> Uh, so don't get me don't get me wrong i i get it but uh yeah i thought it was cool it, it was just like him getting you know lifted up at the end of the show I, I i again subtext subtext man come on that big celebration was it necessary no there was there was there was there was something to it you know there was some other things being said uh, and the most important is chris jericho does not lose like, if you want somebody on your side in AEW, right, and it's not Tony Khan, it's probably Chris Jericho. Yeah, or John Moxley. Either of those two, I feel no, like. I was, just, I was just saying, it's just like, Chris Jericho helped start the company. If anybody has TK's ear, it's him. Basically, if you really think about it, some people might try to find political stuff against them. But as far as in wrestling, basically drama-free. All he does is put over other people and have banger matches. He has yes. done nothing but carry that AEW flag since the show started. So if anybody has TK's ear, it's Mr. Jericho. So if you want somebody on your side, uh, Chris Jericho don't lose. Just put it that way. No, he don't. Not yeah. in AEW that he don't. <laughs> no, he doesn't. But- that was but that that was AEW Dynamite Anniversary. I think it was a really good anniversary show, um, and it was definitely carried by the National Scissors Day, Scissoring Day celebration, which, again, is up for one of AEW's best segments, I feel like, at least in my personal humble opinion. But we will now move to AEW Rampage slash Battle of the Belts uh, 4. Uh, first up, we open the show with Claudio Castagnoli, John Moxley, Wheeler Yuta, Members of the Blackpool Combat Club facing off against Private Party and Roosh. Uh, and yeah, I thought this was a fine enough match of the Blackpool Combat Club kicking the shit out of people. Mostly, Roosh was kind of the only real person who got involved. Mark Quinn accidentally kicked Roosh, continuing how they are not getting along with the Andrade's, team, Andrade's group and whatnot. Um, and Yuta was the one who hit the iron bar to get the victory on mark quinn and yeah i thought it was good to see the blackpool combat club get some big names on uh this episode of rampage just because you already knew you had battle of the belts coming up afterwards anyway yeah and i mean that's what it's gonna take with uh rampage you're gonna have to have uh some of those bigger names and you're just gonna have to basically make your show can't miss and then people will stop missing it. And I just thought this match is a, the type of match they need on Rampage going forward. It was really good. Yeah. Then you move off, and then you get Varsity Blondes facing off against Josh Woods and Tony Nese. And this is the typical uh, uh, 
I think, match that you expect for a Rampage. Um, we had Arn Anderson actually watching this match backstage, which I thought was interesting. Um, and uh, Smart Mark Sterling, after uh, the uh, the Varsity Blondes got beat by Nice and Tony Wo- uh, Tony Nice and Josh Woods, Smart Mark gets in the ring saying he had trademarked the term Varsity uh, and said he's giving the name Varsity Athletes to Tony Nice and Woods. Which I think is a nice little fuck you vibe. Like I, I dug that honestly. I thought that was nice. However, the acclaim come out and they force them to run away. And um, I thought it was kind of cool seeing the varsity blondes get stuck up for by the acclaimed. I thought that was a nice little moment. But yeah, you know, it was a typical rampage match yeah. with, with some nice story stuff added at the end of it. You just witnessed the end of the varsity blondes as a tag team. Uh, Pretty much. Uh, yeah, I, I, I see. If, if we pr- predictions, I think Arn's there. I think Pillman and uh, Brock are going to start tagging. They've been tagging on the independent scene for about a year. And that's the that's the weird thing. He hasn't been tagging with Griff on the independent scene. I think Griff's going to go his way. Brian Pillman uh, is going to go his way. And I think, you know, Arn's going to start tagging, uh, start uh, managing them. Uh, Cause a long time ago, in a land, land far away, Brian Pillman and Arn Anderson tagged together, and now their sons are going to tag together. So that's pretty cool. That is very cool. Uh, the Madison Rain and Sky Blue versus Sky Blue versus Anna J Anna J A S and Ty, Ty Mello happened. Um, um, they uh, they called Tay J A S. Is Ty J A S J T? Yeah. Yeah, very, it's very interesting. To yeah, Tay J A S or whatever. Yeah, just start adding A S to everything. Uh, I guess. Call for me sure. Floyd A S. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Mm-hmm. There you go. And this was a match. Honestly, Anna J makes the Sky Blue tap with the Queen Slayer. Um, I'm hoping that Sky Blue does eventually kind of work her way up and up the ranks and be able to get involved a little bit more. I don't think she's there yet, at least established wise, but I think she could be a good addition, you know, I think, but this is what it was. You know, Sky Blue has kind of the potential to be like the acclaimed of the women's division because yeah, like, I mean, she's literally wasn't in wrestling very long when she signed with AEW. So this whole thing is, uh, you know, it's all just, you know, she's in developmental and she just happens to be developing developing on national TV. So when her push comes, whenever that is, uh, hopefully because of she's had all this time on TV, she'll be ready for it when it's when the ball's given to her. And tagging up with Madison Rain, I mean, come on, that's a veteran, veterans veteran of wrestling. So definitely uh, that's how you get better. Yeah. And then the main event of the Rampage side of things was Death Triangle versus the Dark Order for the AEW World Trios Championships. Uh, And this was good. This was probably, you look at this, and this was the best match for the Rampage side of things. Um, It's good to see the Trios titles get get defended, um, even though they weren't able to be defended on the Battle of the Belt side of things. We at least got to see the Trios titles defended, um, and Dark Order is a a good group to face off against for it. And everybody did a good job, I think, in this match. All right, so I'm at this point. I doubt the Dark Order should win. Uh, it's it's like, I don't know. I know that th- there's the whole Brody thing, and I love Silver and Reynolds and all of them. It just seems like the Dark Order has lost, like, any energy it's ever had. And yes. It, and it's almost like you really need to do something else. And, it, 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 I mean, again, and I know it probably means – more than them than it, it will ever because I, I love the Dark Order. Don't get me wrong. I, I absolutely love the Dark Order at its time, but it's just like at this point it's becoming so weak that it's almost a characteristic of what it used to be. So it's like either push it or kind of let it go. And then if your goal is to one day bring Brody Jr. and have a new Dark Order with him one day, let it go away for a while. And then when it's time, bring it back. Yeah, no, I get it. I love these guys. I do. Dark Order is, you know, got some great people in it. But, I mean, and like with the people that have left and the luster, the fact that this team just doesn't win 
and really people only care about it whenever Hangman decides to do stuff with the Dark Order. Like, I mean, it, it is what it is, man. Like, a lot of bad instances have come up because of outside things that kind of fucked over the Dark Order. But I think it's fair that, you know, you have these guys take a step back, at least from being in the group. I don't think that means you can't have these guys on TV because, I mean, they're all good wrestlers. Um, and John Silver is a fucking stud. Like, I mean, he could do whatever the hell you want him to do. Um, and Ten's great as well. Um and Uno and, and Reynolds could tag or whatnot. Or, and, like, you could do whatever you wanted to do. Like, and Uno, I think, is pretty happy with just running the AEW, like, the AEW Games channel and stuff like that and doing cool shit like that. Um, but I think just as a, as a unit, this, this is, they, they mean nothing right now. They just, they're, they are there because they represent the legacy of Brody Lee. And, I mean, that's fine, but, you know, they should be doing more. Yeah, like I said, it's just, at this point in time, it's just, you know, maybe it's time for it to go away. But, because, like, I I would be probably other, you know, probably one of the happiest people ever if Simmer and Reynolds ever won the tag team titles. I just love those two. Love them so much. They're so good. It's just, it just feels, like I said, it just, they feel kind of lost right now. Yeah, no question about it. But, uh... We then move over to Battle of the Belts 4, which opens with the All-Atlantic Championship. Pac already getting in the ring again, and he goes up against Trent. These guys did really good. Uh, it was good to see Trent f- go for a championship and um, be in a singles match, no less. Um, and him and Pac did really fucking great work. Pac got the win because he cheated with the ring bell hammer, th- hitting him in the face with it. Orange Cassidy came out trying to get... Uh, Retribution, he was really trying to get revenge, beating the shit, uh, trying to go after Pac. Um, and having their feud continue, I think, is good as well. Um, and this was a really good opener. This this had a good sign, I think, for uh, for Battle of the Bounce. Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, it was... Forget how good Trent is sometimes, and then Pac is so great. I... Uh, yeah, I just thought this was a really good match. And, you know, the end was, yeah, the hammer, man. <laughs> That's what it is, man. It, it, the hammer. It's, 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 a, it's an effective weapon because anybody knows sells a hammer, you know, it's crazy. It's a hammer. It's a no, hammer. yeah. You got to lose. <laughs> uh, we then had the TBS championship match between Jade Cargill and Willow Nightingale. Um, and Willow uh, was doing some stuff. Uh, uh, toward like they were knocking each other towards the uh, arena and everything like that, like arena floor. And eventually, the Willow gets uh, a ho- like lifted up and uh, on the steps by uh, Jade, and just shoves her to the floor. And she then takes her and cannonballs her in the ring. However, Jade was able to hit Jade, hit uh, the Jaded on uh, on Willow Nightingale and retain the title. Um, and when we're like, okay, well, Willow lost again, so what's what's next for Jade and everything like that? We then have Vicky Guerrero come up and distract Jade and the bad, ba- the baddies, and then Nyla is gonna grab the TBS title and just like take off, yeah. takes off with it. That was so funny, such a yeah. funny moment. Here's the thing: I'm all for Nyla just being allowed, like, just fucking like own you like twitter troll person just like really fuck with you kind of person um and i think her going up against jade is very interesting honestly because i mean first of all you got a former aw world champion now trying to get the other women's championship on the roster and she would be the first person to hold both titles which i think would be huge if that was the case but uh but yeah i think this is a nice little change of pace uh for jade and her never-ending winning streak yeah, and you know what's cool is that uh, Nyla has her crew too, so that's going to balance it out, and it has a good chance to do, you know, of almost being like a fair and square match, you know. And there's that storyline there, so I really uh, did enjoy this. I think Willow's great. I think um, I, I think there's a spot for her as the ROH Women's Champion. And then eventually as, you know, the AEW Women's Champion, just because she has that energy, that spark, fans seem to love her. So that's all you need right there, right? 
Yeah, pretty much, yeah. And we then had a uh, hook. Uh, he got an envelope from the Trustbusters that was given to him last week, which got ripped up. Who could have saw that coming? Uh, but, I mean, it was a way to get Hook on the show. Um, and he's going to be doing stuff with the Trustbusters, most likely, as Rampage continues. Uh, and then we get to the main event of uh, Battle of the Belts 4. The Ring of Honor World Champion Tag Team Championship match between the Gates of Agony. Uh, and it's uh, Khan and Toa Leon- Leona facing off against FTR, Cash and Dax. Um Floyd, do you want to take this? It's your boys. Yes, uh, this match was a good match. It was a really good match. Very physical. Um, I felt, uh, while watching the match, uh, they told a great story. Uh, Toa, uh, Toa and, uh, Toa and, what's it, Khan? Khan. Uh, yeah, they're just, they just come straight at you. That's their it. That's the thing. They weren't going to back down. Hey, hey, you know, and, you know, X, hey, hey. Uh, FTR had to match their physicality and they used their tag team prowess and at the end they basically got it to where it was one on one and I loved how you know Toll was no selling them trying to do the, uh, trying to do uh, the big rig and you know he wouldn't let them lift them and then they finally hit it and then they finally was able to put the match away on Khan very fun match very solid match it's so weird that as good as the match was, I would probably say it was probably FTR's worst match of the year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's the weird thing about it. Yeah, it's like, you know, it was a good match, but, you know, yeah, it was... it's not, like, with what FTR has done in the past couple, like, past year, Yeah, like, this is low on the totem pole. Yeah, and it was just like, it, it felt like some people were in the wrong position quite a bit. And and it was just like the timing was off on some of the execution, and it was just yeah, it was kind of weird. And then after the match, uh, Brian Cage came out, and they start beating up on FTR. Wardlow evens up the odds, and then Samoa Joe also came out. So basically, very similar to what happened on Dynamite, but this time FTR was the ones getting saved. Yes. Um, yeah, it was it it was cool. I. I Think this has to lead to War Joe, War Joe versus FTR, right? Please, I mean, dear God, just think of how good that would be, dude. I just was just going through a list of matches that FTR could have, and then uh, someone had asked uh, Dax, who is dream opponents that he hasn't wrestled with in AEW, or and he said, uh, Dan- uh Brian Danielson and uh, John Moxley, and I was like, oh, well, screw the two singles matches. Let's do Danielson and Moxley versus FTR. <laughs> Let's give that 30 minutes at the end of Dynamite and let them do their thing. Oh, my God, that would be so physical. I don't know, I don't know if I love FTR or hate FTR by, uh, by uh, suggesting that match <laughs> because that's going to be a very physical fight, and I would love it. And it's just like, like I said, it's just so much, it's so much out there for FTR to do uh, that, uh, you know, and you have this show on Fridays that has been struggling to draw people. Mm-hmm. Hey, it could be FTR Fridays, baby. Let's go. FTR Fridays, let's do this. No, but uh, just in general, I just thought this Battle of Belts and Rampage were good. Yeah, no, they were good. I thought um, there were some good matches on there, you know. It, it definitely helped to, like, you know, give a little bit of a boost to Rampage, which, again, still kind of needs to find its way a bit. But I thought this was a good way to wrap up the anniversary weekend, uh, the anniversary week of AEW. Uh, and yeah, I thought I thought this was I thought this was a good little good little bit right there. But that'll do it for our review of last week of AEW. Let's go into what we got for Rampage and Dynamite this week in Toronto. Of course, we get the Billy Gunn and Swerve Strickland match, probably the match I'm looking forward to the most. Honestly, I'm just so gas to see that happen and that's 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 just me though but there's so much other good shit here i mean you got jungle boy jack versus luchasaurus uh tony storm and hikaru shida teaming to face Britt baker and jamie Hayter. you got uh all atlantic championship match between pack and oc and then another ring of honor world title defense chris jericho versus brian danielson that especially could be awesome too but i mean like this looks pretty fucking good like honestly like a good 
really good setup, I think, for uh, for what they're teasing right now. Dude, um, this looks like a solid show for old Toronto. Um, when I'm looking at it, I just like wish more Canadians were on the show. So, but they there always, you go, yeah. They always add more matches. So uh, I did, I did miss a match. Ego, uh, Ethan Page versus Matt. Is that going to be on Rampage? Uh, I believe that'll probably be on Rampage, but let me let me let me check to see for sure if that's the case. Because it was on the road to Toronto thing. With, yes, <laughs> yes. So I uh, I didn't know. So yeah, Ethan versus Ethan uh, wrestling in Toronto on the on the on the Dynamite tweet. They do not list that as any of the matches. That it does not list that on part of the matches so, for. Uh, yeah, for, I think it's, think it's going to probably be Rampage. Page. Yeah, but um, two point there's a huge hard. There's a good amount of uh, Canadian uh, representation on the AEW roster, and I'm hoping they all get on the show. And FTR Toronto means a lot to my boys. Uh, one of their best matches ever with Gargano and Ciampa happened in Toronto, so I'm hoping you know they get their moment and shine. They're actually in the meet and greet tomorrow. Yeah. Um, and that is our preview for uh, next week, for this week in AEW. Uh, the one thing I wanted to add, too, because I know that we didn't have much other stuff in news and notes, but uh, uh, we had tonight on uh, AEW Dark. Um, hey, we have another, uh, we have another re- uh, return uh, from the fallout uh, from All Out. Brandon Cutler's back. Yeah, he was on Dark Elevation and Dark. Uh, a lots of lots of uh, press and pub and positive comments for his match with Serpentico. I have not watched it. I actually plan on watching it tonight. I did watch his match with Kent Sagan. Very fun. Uh, very fun. Uh, Brandon Cutler is su- very athletic, surprisingly good at the com- comedy wrestling. Uh, so they definitely did some c- comedic stuff tonight. So I definitely say suggest I suggest you check out that match at least with Kip Sabian that was on Dark uh, Serpentico match. I've been hearing from everybody that it was a really good match. So I definitely say check that out too. So I'm I'm happy Cutler's back. So on my uh, AEW uh, my AEW uh, turnbuckle pad, I believe Brandon Cutler was the second person to sign my turnbuckle pad. Oh, and, 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 uh, it was, yeah, um, and it was kind of cool that, and he was like, oh, you want me to sign it? And it was just kind of like, he was genuinely shocked that pretty much anybody wanted his autograph, and I just thought that was cool, because he's one of the people that I always root for, and I, and it's one of those things, like, I root for him as a wrestler, but I kind of root for him as a person, because he just mm-hmm. always is a genuinely nice dude. Yeah, no, I, I... I had a small chance uh, during uh, Double or Nothing 2019 weekend at Starcast to interview him uh, with his signing and everything like that, um, and yeah, it was it was definitely really cool. Um, I was funny. I I was talking to some of the people on media at that time. Like literally, they had to like go on their phone and look up like shit about him because they didn't know. And I like the fact that Brandon has like established himself as an integral part of just the AEW like lineage, like like since the company's inception. Um, and also I think it's good that he's actually being able to do stuff now and he kind of can get out of all this backstage bullshit for right now, which is good. Hey, yeah. You know, I mean, it seems like from everything I heard, he was just kind of an instance to bystand. Yeah. Through it all they were just, he was just somebody who had to take a fall because everyone was getting nailed yeah, with suspensions and shit. There in the spot. And as you can tell, he's back. So, you know, he seems to be doing okay. And yeah, like I said, all he's one of those people I'm always gonna root for. Always gonna no, root yeah. for because he just his story is great. So yeah, um, what was I gonna throw out there? Uh, yeah, um, Di- uh, I was telling you, Dynamite is actually coming to Texas in December again. It is. It's been a while. It's been a while. Uh, Texas was a hot spot for AEW uh, for uh, during the pandemic, so it's kind of cool when they first started traveling. They did a lot of shows in Texas. It's kind of cool they got away from a while. Hopefully, they can build up some energy and sell a lot of tickets because the shows the show's going to be good. Uh, the first uh, one is in December seventh in Cedar Park, 
and I believe Dallas is going to happen one week or another after that. I'm trying to go to all of them, of course, because I'm a big old weirdo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's going to be a ton of fun for sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely... I'm definitely missing the lack of AEW shows I have been able to go to since Blood and Guts. But again, like I said, I I, I blew through everything the first half of this year, and I'm gonna have to go out the rest of 2022, and I'll just I'll wait to see what 2023 brings us. Though I'm about to blow a lot of money on Ed Sheeran tickets, so that's uh, we'll see how my bank account is doing after that, and if AEW is still in the picture for 2023 for me. No, I'm I'm very I I'm happy for you. I know how much you love Ed Sheeran, so I'm happy that you get to go to those shows. I'm gonna have to try to get tickets tomorrow morning first, and then then we'll be good. Are so, you like part of his fan club or anything? This I don't. I'm not a part of any fan club, like like a listing or anything like that. Like I don't I don't dig further into that. I would just say that out of everybody that I know and like all of my friends, like nobody likes. Ed Sheeran more than I do like it's 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 weird because I mean he's the biggest male pop star in the world but at the same time in this country like you don't view him as that because he's not a pop star he's just Ed Sheeran yeah uh but like know his catalog front to back own every album of his on vinyl have multiple things signed by him actually uh since last year Uh, I've only seen him in concert once though and it was an experience. This will be the last thing I say, and then we'll close out the show because this is just this is off topic completely. But the last time I saw him, he was only the second person to perform at uh, Little Caesars Arena when it was first built in Detroit. The first person, Kid Rock. I'm very sorry. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I saw that. I was in the back upper bowl, like way in the back, but in the front row of upper bowl, and I. I loved it, but I hated it because, like, I couldn't stand up and dance and sing a lot because everyone around me was sitting down like a bunch of fucking squares, and it bugged the shit out of me. So I told people, I'm blowing the bank account out for this show because I don't want to be around people that are lame and sit around and just sit on their hands for the show. I get it, Ed Sheeran, he does wedding music. It's not a lot of stuff that you can sing and dance to, but this guy can put on a show. I know that. And he has great songs that are outside of the whole... You know, thinking out louds and perfects and shit like that. Uh, so is Stone Cold trying to go first row? That's what I'm trying to do. That's oh. what I'm trying. I mean, that's that was my plan. But at the same time, though, uh, my family is interested in going. Um, they do not want to spend the money that I want to spend. But I do think that it would be a chance that like my entire family could go. And our good friend Jared, he might be deciding to make the trip to Detroit to go see the show. Because while he is coming to L.A., he does not want to see Ed Sheeran in L.A. because the rapper Russ is opening up for those shows, and he hates Russ, like, with a passion. Uh, so he does. It literally makes him not want to go see the show. So he might try, make the trip to go to Detroit to come see it with us, in which okay. case I will happily go back lower bowl as long as it's good seats. Like, it's a 360 stage. Let me tell There's you, no bad seat in the house. Let me tell you this, this amazing thing that I've learned, and it took me a while to learn it. I'm not a big concert goer. Well, let's just say you only want to see the main act. Only show up for the main act. Yeah. <laughs> like, just, just show up an hour and a half late. You, I mean, honestly, in the world that we live in, you literally can get a report on concerts on what time they get on stage every night. Oh, yeah. Dude, it's crazy. I just, like... Like I'm not a concert goer. I'm a I'm a wrestling guy, you know. I'm not a concert goer. But the the amount of information that you can have to go to a concert, it's like, oh, the man doesn't get on the thing to nine thirty. I know the show starts at seven, but they don't even get on stage to nine thirty, dude. You get to the building about nine, you know, use the restroom, get there, get right to your seat or wherever you're at about nine fifteen. Show starts at nine thirty. Boom! There you go. But this, I think that's the old. I think what I'm talking about is old man shit. I don't think young people do what I'm talking about, right? And uh, I mean, like the people go. Like that's the thing, though. I don't understand that either because there, you'll see so many instances of people going to concerts and then they just stand there for the opening act. And I feel bad because like nobody knows them. Nobody's even trying to give them any like kind of energy or whatnot or good vibes or shit like that. 
It's weird, but I, I've discovered people that I've liked in the opening act, which is I have to bro. Best opening act I ever saw at a concert was uh, Zach Callison, who is actually the voice of Steven Universe. Uh, that dude fucking killed it, and I met him after the show, and he was awesome. Yeah, uh, Breaking Benjamin was a band uh, I love. Yeah, yeah, and I saw them open for Evanescence, and I had never heard of them before. But by the end of the night, I was like, dude, I'm going to buy a break. They Benjamin. are my favorite WWE, like, like pay-per-view theme song band. Yes. And, it'd be, and you know, it's funny. It was before they were a pay-per-view. They were like, they were the new guys. They were like. They were, yeah. Yeah, they were opening up for Evanescence. They were just like, oh, here's a, here's a spot. We got you. And it was like, oh, I really like this music. And I went and bought a, a CD because I'm old. I'm old. We still bought those and uh, just like listen to it. And then I realized I may like music, some music live better than I like listening to it <laughs> at home. Like, and, and I realized that with their music, I was like, I like it. You just like it live better. Oh uh, yeah, I just liked it live better. It was just, it was just like I thought the voice was great and the music was great. But again, we're getting into the weeds here. Uh, sir, yeah. do you want to close this out? Yeah, that will do it, I think, for this episode of All Things Elite. Thank you guys so much for listening. Uh, be sure to continue to support this fine show by downloading it on Google or Apple Podcasts. And if you listen to us on Spotify or wherever you choose to listen to us on, uh, give us a share with your friends, friends, family, coworkers, whoever you wish. And then also leave a rating and a review. Let us know how we're doing. We are at AT Elite Pod on Twitter, at Social Suplex are the guys that make this show possible. Please check out all the other shows on their network. You will not be disappointed. I am at Austin Sumowitz, S-Z-U-M-O-W-I-C-Z. Floyd is at Floyd Johnson Jr. on Twitter. And I will pass it off to Floyd to close us out on this episode and take us home for this episode of All Things Elite. Yes, I usually come in my goodbye asking, you know, for people to be nice and love the world. No, this is not what this is. I need everyone that listens to the show to do me a personal favor. Go see Black Adam. Go see my guy, The Rock, the People's Champ. Go see Black Adam. It's the only way I'm going to get Black Adam versus Superman movie. So, uh, yeah, go see that movie uh, like two or three times, you know, whatever. Just keep going to see it. No, but uh, no matter what you do, I, you still should be nice. Love everybody. Tell all your friends how much you love them every every day. Do all that stuff. But go see Black Adam. That's the actual focus of this. And I will leave you how I always leave you. Whether you're at home, work, or school, always do your best to be elite. Hey, it's me, your Uncle Cooper. Sorry to interrupt your music. I do love music, especially when it's set at a reasonable volume. You know, music is really only as good as your speakers. The same is true for minivans. A minivan is only as good as the tires it sits on. And the button on the screen there, it agrees with me. If you click on it, it'll bring you to all the Cooper minivan tires that'll make your minivan a really good minivan. Go with the Coopers! Cooper! Tired of long waits and rushed care at the ER and urgent care clinic? Next time, stay home and let Dispatch Health bring the power of the hospital to you. I call Dispatch Health. A care team of medical professionals actually come to your house. They're the same caliber of people that you would see if you were at a hospital or an urgent care. Dispatch Health can treat most non-life-threatening emergencies. They can do the x-rays, they can do stitches. Urinary tract infections, blood tests, urinalysis, ultrasound. It's almost everything that they can do at the ER. You never feel rushed. They're there for you and only you. I felt like their only patient. And it costs no more than a trip to urgent care because Dispatch Health is covered by most insurance, including Medicare. See if we serve your home at DispatchHealth.com. Dispatch Health really went above and beyond. It's wonderful to have care come to your home. House calls are back and they're better than ever. Learn more at DispatchHealth.com.